Today we're in part five of our fall series that we're calling Good and Beautiful and Kind. And today we're going to talk about humility. And instead of just calling it humility, we decided to add lowering our defense. We want to start off this morning with three questions. And we're hoping that somewhere in the message, before the end even, that you will begin to see why this is an important issue to talk about and why it's so spiritual. But we're going to start off this morning with these three questions. The first one is this. Why do we have such a hard time navigating conflict? I mean, ask yourself that and ponder it for a second. Why, why do you and I have such a hard time navigating conflict? The second question is this. Why do we find it so excruciating to receive criticism? I mean, why is that just so excruciating if, if we receive criticism, especially if it's corrective criticism? And the last question is this. Why do we fill up with anxiety when someone disagrees with us? I, I want to say... Um, to be transparent and let you know, that, that's always been an issue with me, number three. That just like if someone disagrees and I'm certain that I'm right, I'm certain that I said what I said or did what I did with a good intention, if there's any disagreement, it's just like something starts rising up on the inside. I think the reason that we deal negatively so much with conflict and why we find it so excruciating to receive criticism and, and why anxiety seems to, to just boil up in us when someone disagrees, I think it's because we've constructed a life that needs so much constant defending. I mean, we build up this life that we just have to defend. Before we started Simple Church in 2012, um, I was on staff across town over Maryland Heights at a really large church. And when I got hired there, I was hired there to be the pastor of student ministries. And a couple years, maybe two and a half, close to three years in, uh, right after Christmas, I got a call from my boss, which was the um, executive administrative assistant. And she said, uh, cool title, huh? She said, Russ, um, listen, I, 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 I need to talk to you for a second. Can you come into the office? It was on a, a Friday, like late afternoon, and I was off that day. And uh, so I came into the office and she said, okay, here's the deal. Um, she said, our senior pastor came down with the flu and um, it's really bad. So he, he is unable to speak this weekend. And our assistant pastor, who we call a teaching pastor, he also has the flu. So he's not going to be able to speak. And there's this guy that we, we call that's a pastor at another church, but it's just too late notice and he can't come. So there's, then there's, there's that one person on staff that they speak every once in a great while, but they're out of town. So I was wondering if maybe you were available. Yeah. You can imagine the excitement in me. I, I wasn't the first choice, the second choice, the third choice, the fourth choice, the fifth choice. I was just kind of like, hey, so that we don't have to close the doors this Sunday, can this guy come? And I was like, you know, what are you supposed to say? I, I was working. We had student ministry, but I said, okay, I can, I can probably get one of the guys to fill in for me down at, down at the student center, and, and yes, I, I, I can do it. And then it was followed up with, okay, well, here's what we were talking about. Here's the series we're in. So we're going to give you the, a, a big outline here, and here's what we need you to do. Don't say anything that's not on this paper. And I'm like, okay, don't say anything that's not on paper. I'm like, I think I can remember that. And, 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 then, and then after a few more minutes of discussion, she's like, but I mean, maybe you can add something here. Maybe you can add your own story here, your own example here, but, but, but could you do this? So I said yes, and um, secretly I was very excited at the, the, the opportunity to teach in what we called Big Church. And so I was going over this whole outline and getting everything together, and, and we had at that time two services on Saturday night and two on Sunday morning. And so after the first Saturday night service, which I felt pretty good about, I felt like some people laughed, some people maybe cried. I'm hoping they were crying not because it was so bad, but I was like, okay, I felt like there was some sort of connection. I felt pretty good about it. And as soon as the service was over and I walked in the back, there in the room sat three people, all with uh, one of them had an eye pad, one of them had a notepad, the other one had a laptop, and um, one of them was my direct boss, the executive administrative assistant, and she said, hey, Russ, will you take a seat? And I'm like, yeah. And I sat down, and she said, well, how do you feel about the, the service? How do you feel about this first service? And I'm like, well, I feel pretty, pretty good. And she went, okay, well, 
<laughs> cross her legs and she leans back. When somebody crosses her legs and leans back, you're in for the long haul, right? You know, they're getting comfy. And so she had a list of things, um, of words that I had enunciated the wrong way, um, of, of times that I talked too fast and I needed to slow down. Uh, then the other person, it was, it was time for the other person to come up the bat, and um, she had a few things that, that, that needed to be changed, and, and, then, and then the next guy came up, and he had some things that needed to be changed, and it went from how to enunciate a word to, to better tell a story to what color shirt you should wear, and after this 30-minute beatdown, um, I was just like, oh my goodness, and inside my mind, 30 seconds into this deal, I was thinking, you know what? None of you got asked to do this. If you could do it better, maybe, and, the, and these thoughts are going in my mind. So as they're telling me more things, I'm thinking, you know what? I should just walk out of here and see how you guys are going to do it without me. I mean, if you got it, and just the whole conversation, my guard had gone up as soon as I sat down. And 30 seconds into the conversation, there was a wall that I had built up. And my lack of humility in that moment made it so difficult to connect with them and receive their feedback actually as a gift. The goal of that time was to strengthen the message. The, the goal of that period of time was so that the remaining three services we had that weekend, that we could hopefully impact or better impact more people, that more people would be intrigued by the gospel of Jesus. But I viewed that as a personal attack. My pride built up all these walls, and I immediately took a defensive posture. I mean, there was no humility in me. I want to tell you something about humility. Humility isn't just being willing to do the lowly tasks. So much in church life, we look at humility as, okay, I'll be the one to do the lowly tasks, or the ones that, that people don't see. Humility is more than that. It's a life committed to the hard task of lowering one's defense of lowering our defense. Way too often when we envision humility, we think about taking on these menial duties that no one else wants to do. And that's part of humility, but it's just a part. So many times when we think about humility, we think of someone who doesn't seek the spotlight. And that's part of humility, but again, it's only a part. There's this other facet of humility that Christ followers need to master in order to love in this crazy messed up world. We need to be able to live free from building walls and defensive postures. We need to get to the spot spiritually that we stop building up those walls. We need to stop seeing people who disagree with us as competitors and start seeing them as our neighbors. They're not our competitor. They're a neighbor. We have to stop pe seeing people who disagree with us like, like they're a threat that we need to eliminate. We got to learn to live free in Christ and in God's love. That meeting that night that I put my defense mechanisms up, for the remaining seven and a half, eight years after that, every time I spoke, I looked forward to that time where I could go back and sit down with a group of people and they could help me out. And sometimes it was brutal. And it took weeks and weeks and weeks, actually probably months before I began to receive it as a gift. We've got to learn to put these defense, defenses down. We've got to get rid of that attitude that we always have to defend ourselves. And like JJ said several weeks ago, the attitude that we have to defend God. Hey, d check this out. God's big. He is a big God. He does not need you and I to defend him. He's God. We have to move away from that need to have approval from everyone and begin to become okay with some corrective criticism. That's humility. And humility is an ongoing commitment. You, you know that feeling you get when you read an email that someone wants to meet with you and talk to you about something you said or something you did or something you posted on social media? Usually for most of us, within three seconds of reading that, oh, this person wants to meet with me and they want to talk with me. For most of us, within three seconds, the walls go up, the gates are shut, the padlock's put on. You know that feeling that rises up in you when, when someone disagrees with you? Especially if they disagree with your interpretation of Scripture. Then it's like the gloves are off, right? I mean, it's game on. We have to get to a spot that we aren't governed by the words and actions of others. A spot that, that we're okay being questioned. A spot that we're okay to just listen. And Jesus offers us something in his most famous sermon ever. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. 
His sermon in which he gave as a, as a guide to his listeners and followers on how to live a life, a disciplined life, based on this new law of love. I want you to look at what Jesus said. It's a simple passage. One little scripture that we're going to look at today that is so incredibly powerful. It's found in Matthew, the fifth chapter. And Jesus says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This term that Jesus used, his listeners were very familiar with, poor in spirit. It meant someone who was totally 100% dependent on God. It meant someone who refuses to build a life apart from God, that they knew God was involved in everything. Someone who had learned to live before an audience of one, and that one being God. Someone who didn't cling to things. Someone who lives to please and honor God. Someone who doesn't live with their defenses up all the time. See, the person who is poor in spirit doesn't live in this self-protective mode. Because for this person, there's nothing to protect, there's nothing to possess, and there's nothing to prove. And by they have nothing to protect, here's what we mean. There's no need to live covering up their weaknesses and failures. I mean, how many of us, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us spend most of our lives trying to hide or cover up our deficiencies from others. I mean, we know we have some, but we live trying to cover them up and hide them and disguise them. And if we're honest, it's exhausting, isn't it? It's exhausting to live a life protecting and defending yourself. The humble person recognizes that there are so many issues beneath all of our lives that they decide to just live and to do their best. The, the poor in spirit have nothing to possess. And by this, we're not saying you shouldn't own things. We're saying that you should own things, but they shouldn't own you. A person that's poor in spirit lives kind of detached from the things because those things don't own them. They don't let them determine who they are or what they're worth. To live with nothing to possess includes not counting on the opinions of others in order to feel good about ourselves. The idea here is that we let go of the need to cling to a self that we believe we have to project to the world. And we just become who God created us to be. And the reason this is so important is this allows you and I to be present with people who need us. It allows us to be here in the moment. The poor in spirit have nothing to prove. The poor in spirit don't live with this need to prove ourselves to others, to win every argument, to exercise power over other people. This is big. The poor in spirit don't need the last word. How many of you, you just crave the last word? Man, I do. If Becky and I get into a, in the church we call it a disagreement. What it really is is a doggone argument, okay? When we get in an argument, I just crave the last word. I just crave. Becky can be so right I mean, 1,000% right, and she can like, get to the end of what we're doing, and she can just spell it all out and sort it all out, and at that point, we just need to stop, and I have this innate need to get the last word in, and it usually starts with, yeah, that's good, but. When you got to start with, yeah, that's good, but, you're just being a but, okay? So don't, don't stop doing that, all right? That's not in the notes, and I'm going to get in trouble for that later, but here's the deal. You don't have to have the last word. When Jesus offered these words, the poor in spirit, I seriously, here's what I picture him doing. Like he's opening this portal into life in the kingdom of God. He's saying the humble people are those who live in the fullness of this kingdom because they've got nothing to prove. They have nothing to possess. They have nothing to protect. They're just there and they want to please God. They, they want to be a, a, a conduit of God's love. They want to make sure that when people see them, they see a true reflection of God. Imagine a world marked by this type of humility. I mean, heck, imagine a church that walked in this type of humility. Imagine being the kind of person who, when approached by someone who was upset with you because of something you said or did, imagine being a person not trying to protect immediately, not building walls immediately. I mean, what if you and I were the type of person that were just free enough to say, hey, can you share more with me about what you see? This week, as we were getting ready for this message, um, Becky and I had a disagreement. 
And, and I wanted to set her straight is what I wanted to do because I knew my way was better and higher and more holy and pleasing to the Lord and upright and worthy, right? I mean, I knew that it was a given, yeah. So I wanted to set her straight on everything. And, and I stopped and I was like, Beck, will you like, I, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna do something that I'm not good at. I'm gonna shut up. And would you explain to me, like, what, why, why do you see it that way? Like, explain to me what's going on. And after Becky passed out and hit the ground, you know, it was like that pause where she's like, and then I became suspect. She's like, what are you up to? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not up to anything. I'm just trying to practice what I'm going to preach later. And I want to know what, where, where this comes from. And she sat down and she shared this view and, and you know what? Everything she was saying, and I'm not saying it's going to be like this all the time, everything that she was saying became so crystal clear. It became so blindingly obvious why she was seeing it that way that all I could do in my moment of pride is go, oh, 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 oh. And she's like, so you see? And I'm like, oh, I'm not exactly saying I see. And she's like, you see? I can see that you see. And I'm like, what? She goes, see, I can see you see. Like a Dr. Seuss moment in the house. We're like, yeah, hey, how about that? And, and she went, okay, well, I guess we'll talk more later. Just sitting there going, man, I, I totally see. Imagine being a person headed into a difficult conversation, ready to listen and to ask questions and to possibly learn something versus being defensive. So why are we talking about this in church? Well, we're talking about it in church because Jesus said in his most famous sermon ever, the poor in spirit, the poor in spirit. God wants to empower you and I to live in a humble way, in a way that we can listen, in a way that we can learn. He wants the world to see a true reflection of him, and he wants people to experience healing. And let me ask you a question. How can the world be healed without humility? How in the world are they going to be healed with that humility? There's one thing that I found in Scripture that has begun to help me, and I think it can help us retain. It help us can, can get and, and retain humility, and, and it's called the Jesus Prayer. It's this ancient prayer that's found in the Gospels. It was most popular or profoundly adapted by Christians in, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. And you can find it in Luke's gospel, chapter 18. And the prayer is very simple. It says this, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Listen, humility can form a love in you and I that is so deep. It can make us whole. It can make us connect better to God. It can begin to heal us from the inside out. It can begin to heal this crazy world we live in. The reason humility is so important is because lack of humility closes us off. It closes us off to the love of God, and it closes us off from people who need us. I mean, it just shuts us down. But to lower our defense... It means we're making space for other people, that we're allowing to hear from them. As we prepare our hearts today to partake of communion, I, I want to urge you to just kind of do a self-examination and just ask yourself, how, how am I doing in this area of humility? How am I doing? It's so important. As I think about Jesus heading to the cross, here's what I realize. In that moment, there is no defensiveness in him, none, not one ounce. In the crucifixion, when Jesus' body is nailed to the wood, to that old rugged wooden cross, it was an expression of his refusal to vindicate or defend himself. It was it. Stretched out his arms. For you and I to be crucified with Christ, it calls us to to be the same way. It calls us to that same way of being. And listen, I, I'm not suggesting that we subject ourselves to abuse or mistreatment. That's, that's ridiculous. 
But what I have in mind is our willingness, our willingness to just lay down every identity that we've constructed that we believe we need to defend. And we just let God defend us. We just live out our faith. And we walk in humility, the humility like Jesus walked in. I mean, Jesus was going to that cross knowing there was no sin in him. There was no mistake. There was no blunder. All these accusations and all these things didn't try to defend, didn't try to vindicate. He believed that God had a plan, a bigger plan and a better plan. And he believed that his part and his assignment in that plan was to love, to love like his father. Too many times we look at humility and we just see certain facets. Several years ago, right after we had got this building and we were still renting it, um, I was here on a Saturday night. There had been an event that day, and, and I was cleaning things up, and a volunteer from the church stopped by to, to pick something up that they forgot. And uh, they said to me, oh, my goodness, are, are you here cleaning? And I went, yeah, I'm just, just cleaning. And, and she said, well, can, well, let me stay and help you clean. So she stayed, and, 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 and we were cleaning. And as we were cleaning up, she came back, and she said, I can't believe that you're cleaning. I mean, you must be so, you, you're just so humble that you're here cleaning. And I'm thinking, no, the church is dirty. And we got church in the morning. And it's really, I mean, it, it really wasn't an act of humility. It was just it needed to be done. So I started doing it. And we got in this conversation about humility. And we realized something about each other that night. We had both actually looked at things like that as being humble doing things that weren't seen, doing things outside the spotlight. And, and for both of us, as we talked, it was kind of like, you know what? That's really how both of us have lived for most of our lives. Oh, we're being humble because we're doing this. But that's just a piece of humble. The bigger piece, the more important piece of humility is you and I being okay, being questioned. You and I being able to listen. You and I are not putting those walls up when someone disagrees with us. I am so thankful, and I'm certain you are too, that Jesus didn't put a bunch of walls up when people disagreed with him. That when it came to the cross, instead of disagreeing, that he willingly went and said, I'm going to do this as an act of love. I have a lot to learn in the area of humility. And today, as we just begin to prepare for communion, I, I want you to just stop for a second and just ask, how am I doing? How, how am I doing? And if you want to help gauge that, just kind of ask yourself, when, when someone disagrees with me, what's the first thing that happens? Is the first thing that happens I want to stop and listen, or is the first thing that happens all of a sudden I get defensive? What's the first thing that happens when somebody wants to talk to you about politics, but they're from a different party? defensive or is it, hey, I just, I'll, I'll listen. What's the first thing that happens in you when someone disagrees with the way you interpret scripture? Is it something rises up and you want to get defensive and you want to argue or is it just something you want to listen and learn? That there is something to be said about humility. Jesus said the poor in spirit, the poor in spirit. I think Jesus was saying to us, if you want to reflect my father, you got to be poor in spirit. You got to walk in humility. Because this world that we live in, I don't think healing will ever even start without humility. God, thank you so much for this place called Simple Church. And God, thank you um, for your love for us. I pray that we would walk away today in humility and that we'll, we would remain humble. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys next weekend.